My name is Luz Olohaus. I am here at UCLA, uh, assistant professor in psychiatry and computational medicine and human genetics. Uh, I've been at CGSI for a while. I think the first time was 2016. Um, we were just talking yesterday with Eliezer where about the fact that I was going completely off the tangent during my talk, talked about the ki my kids and my travel, and, um, and that video ended up on YouTube and I got so many comments from people that said, I saw that YouTube video and your kids and how are your kids? <laughs> so I, I was like, I'm gonna be very professional this time and not have 10 years of people asking me silly questions. All right, so uh, we all love biobanks. Uh, that's why we're here. Uh, I would like to tell you today a story about uh, a biobank that we are building in South America and Colombia um, that is kind of a combination of a biobank and a cohort study. Uh, and uh, it focuses on severe mental illness. So, uh, psychiatric genetics have seen a lot of success in the last 10 years. Um, we now can identify loci that are robustly associated with disease and we also have identified some rare variants that confer larger risk uh, to developing schizophrenia in this case. This is a plot. Uh, the x-axis are is minor allele frequency and the y-axis are the odds ratio of variants associated with schizophrenia. Um, variants or genes. I should say. Uh, to get to this state, um, we, we, had, we needed 75,000 cases of schizophrenia, uh, mostly uh, uh, of European ancestry, um, are, the, are the people that are so far included in the studies. And mostly these are built from clinical cohorts, meta-analysis of clinical cohorts. So cohorts that are um, recruited for a, a single study or a single uh, diagnosis. And so these cohort studies uh, are, in, in the case of psychiatry, have like great benefits. For example, you can have very careful diagnosis. Uh, you usually done through a three-hour interview. Um, you have deep phenotyping, including symptoms. Um, some of the disadvantages that I put in orange here are usually these cohorts have very strict inclusion criteria. So, uh, for example, they focus on a single diagnosis. Uh, or uh, a single type of patients that are, for example, very severe or respond to treatment in a certain way. And also, a disadvantage of cohort studies is that they are, you know, usually, you know, recruited at a single time point and there's only one time point of measurement. Uh, having longitudinal information is very costly. Now, biobanks, on the other hand, have some of the benefits that cohorts don't have. For example, longitudinal information comes for free. Uh, you have broad inclusion criteria. Everybody that is in the biobank is in the biobank. Uh, there is some bias there, but uh, I don't want to talk about that too much. Um, the disadvantage that people often mention, especially in the case of uh, severe mental illness or psychiatric disorders, is that the diagnosis may be noisy. Uh, and also that the relevant symptoms, for specifically for psychiatry, may not be systematically recorded in the EHR. You know, what we see uh, in the EHR is what is used for clinical care. So that, you know, that is, that is both an advantage and a disadvantage. And in case of severe mental illness, the sample sizes where we're currently at are still too small for discovery. Here's an example of the ATLAS database. This is just data I pulled a few months ago. Uh, at UCLA, we have 1.9 million patients with diagnoses. Uh, out of those, 230,000 have been approached um, to be part of ATLAS, our, our UCLA Biobank, which is about 12%. And out of those 230,000, 67% says, yes, I would like to be included. Now, if we look at schizophrenia, we have about 6,000 patients with schizophrenia in our EHR. 400 of those have been approached uh, to be part of the Biobank, which is 7%. So that's quite a bit lower than um, the 12% um, of the overall patient population at UCLA, and only 58% or 58% says 
says, yes, I would like to be included in the biobank. Um, then there are, you know, there are some differences by self-reported race and ethnicity that we see. For example, um, uh, you know, in case of black uh, participants, only 46% agrees to uh, be part of the biobank. And this is a trend, this is here I'm showing for schizophrenia, but that trend holds also for the patient population in general. So overall we have about, because these numbers are small, this is not exact, uh, 230 patients with schizophrenia for whom we currently have DNA. And so that's not really yet at the, um, uh, at the sample size that we need for our genetic studies, at least for discovery. So the question is, can we combine the best of both worlds? And so for that, I'm going to talk about the Paisa population of Colombia. Um, it's a very special region in Colombia um, that is uh, home uh, to the uh, coffee region. It's very beautiful there. There's mountains there. I definitely recommend you visit if you haven't. Um, and in, in the Paisa region live uh, about 9 million individuals. And the reason it's special uh, from a geneticist perspective is that it is a population isolate. So this population was founded in the 16th century uh, through initial admixture uh, between uh, Spanish, mostly males, and Native American females that lived there. And then um, in addition, and, and so the, there was a huge bottleneck followed by rapid expansions, and not just one, but multiple times as through the centuries the population sort of moved down into the region. Um, I'm not going to talk about these genetic characteristics of the population isolate that were identified in the Paisa population. You can look at uh, Jaslyn Mooney's paper um, from 2018. And so in this region, uh, we are building, uh, together with my collaborators Nelson Freimer and Carlos Lopez and, and many other people, uh, a biobank that is called Mission Origin. Um, which is a Latin American biobank of severe mental illness. And the goal for this biobank is to include 100,000 subjects, 50,000 patients uh, with severe mental illness, which is broadly defined as having a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, or severe depression. Uh, but it's important to know that we want to include patients regardless of their very specific diagnosis. We are recruiting 42,000 new individuals from three large psychiatric hospitals in the region. And we already have recruited 8,000 participants through an earlier study, which was called the PISA project, uh, where we uh, have very deep phenotyping information uh, available through these large three-hour gold standard interviews. Um, we uh, are recruiting controls through Sura, which is a large, uh, it's one of the largest health insurance and healthcare providers in Colombia. It's kind of a little bit like Kaiser Permanente here in, in US. Uh, and we're recruiting 50,000 controls uh, through Sura, um, through their primary care facilities. And these are screened for not having severe mental illness and otherwise matched uh, to the cases on age, geographic location, gender, and education. Um, the phenotyping, because this is such a large study, we don't have time or money or it's in, not in any way feasible to do these large interviews on all these participants. And so the phenotyping relies entirely on electronic health records. So for those three psychiatric hospitals, we have EHR of almost 400,000 uh, psychiatric patients. Uh, collected since 2003, exact date depends a little bit on the hospital. We also have the EHR through Sura from all the controls. Uh, and one of the nice things that I should mention is that 25% of the cases happen to have Sura insurance. Uh, and so that is nice because we have their psychiatric EHR and also uh, their, you know, standard Sura EHR on the same participants. Um, we are collecting blood of all these participants. They are sent here to UCLA and uh, genotyping is done using the blended genome exome product that is a new uh, product developed at the Broad Institute uh, together with Illumina, which is basically a blend of deep exome sequencing and low-pass whole genome sequencing. It's another best of the both world talks that one could give uh, at some point, but for now uh, we're a little early stage to um, 
to really evaluate the, the genotype information. Uh, this is part, the, the genotyping is done as part of another project that is called PUMAS um, that I'll talk about some other time. So mission origin, we will enable us to do genetic discovery uh, for diagnosis, uh, specific symptoms and behaviors, um, also across diagnosis, so not just looking at who is going to have, you know, schizophrenia, uh, but, you know, comparing patients with different uh, diagnoses in the same, uh, recruited in the same way, in the same setting. Um, you know, we're interested in characterizing genetic risk for severe mental illness and the relation between environmental risk uh, and genetic risk factors in the region. And finally, because we have the EHR, we're very interested in performing longitudinal analysis of disease trajectories. Um, and I think, and I give, make this point a lot, that now is the time that we can actually study course of illness genetically, um, in addition to just ultimate outcomes. Okay, but of course we need to know that these phenotypes from the electronic health records are any good. Um, and here is one uh, of the sites in Manizales. This is the uh, hospital that we started recruitment for the PISA project. We have re been recruiting for a very long time and we've also had access to the EHR for a very long time. Uh, this is kind of a special hospital because it serves all the inhabitants of the state of Caldas, which is, you, you can kind of see, um, regardless of health insurance status um, of the people living there. So we have all the, you know, standard EHR available, diagnosis, demographics, clinical notes, medications, labs, all kinds of tables. Uh, and so the first question that we asked is, are these diagnoses accurate? And because we started there in that hospital with the PISA project where we did the interviews, we can actually compare EHR diagnosis to the interview diagnosis. Uh, and we did that here in 3,427 patients. Uh, and we're comparing uh, interview-based diagnosis on the rows uh, to EHR-based diagnosis on the columns. And what we can see is that, um, you know, if, if something is on diagonal, it's good. That means it's aligned, right? If something is off diagonal, it is, uh, uh, it's, it's a mistake somewhere. Um, and so we see that majority of uh, diagnoses are good, and you might not be so familiar with psychiatric diagnosis, but psychiatric diagnoses are actually very hard to make. Uh, the, the F1 that we get and the kappa that we get from, these, uh, from this alignment is actually greater than the inter-rater reliability of the net skit, of the interview itself. Um, so if you have two individuals uh, do the same interview, you get a similar picture, sometimes even worse, than if you here compare electronic health records to interview-based diagnosis. One thing I should say that the recruitment happens through the hospitals, and so uh, the interviewer has access to, uh, knows beforehand what the, what the hospital-based diagnosis is. So they're, yeah, that's just something to be aware of. Um, okay, so, the diagnoses are great, but it's not perfect, right? Because there are some off-diagonal individuals. People specifically, there's a large group of patients that have a diagnosis of MDD uh, in the interview, but an electronic health record diagnosis of the EHR. And we spend a lot of time trying to figure out, tease apart who is who in those groups that are off-diagonal. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, bore CGSI uh, contingent here with, with that uh, exercise. Um, but what we did do is we said, well, you know, here we're just using diagnosis, but we have all this other information in the EHR. Can we improve the alignment with the skid diagnosis by just, you know, using that other information? And so we did, we did that. Um, we trained a pretty basic uh, a model, such as an elastic net model, a random forest, actually boost model. And then we trained uh, using other information on the EHR to predict basically skid diagnosis, so interview-based diagnosis. And so... Um, Sorry, the skid diagnosis are those based on multiple kind of uh, people? Because you were saying there's kind of natural variation what uh, each person who does the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's kind of the gold standard is not perfect. Right. So if you're trying to match that mm -hmm. perfect gold standard, is, is that something that 
It, it's right. a really good question. Uh, I mean, I totally agree with you in principle. There is no real gold standard uh, in psychiatry. Uh, people have used this diagnosis as the gold standard. Um, but it's never perfect, right? Because it's a person sitting down with a patient, sometimes somebody else in addition to the patient, and asking them about their history. Uh, and based on that, you're gonna arrive, you know, there is a structure, right? There is a structure of the DSM, and there is, if you have these symptoms and this and this happened, then you arrive at that diagnosis. But, you know, that might vary depending on how you probe, you know, how, you know, how the conversation goes, um, yeah. And so, but, but yeah, because it is the gold standard used in the field, uh, we, are, we are using this now here. But we know, in fact, I, don't, I didn't include slides, but sometimes this kid is just wrong. Like for example, we have patients that arrive at a depression diagnosis, and we know that they have been hospitalized for a manic episode. And one of the thing, you know, by definition, if you have, have a manic episode, you are a bipolar disorder case. And so the diagnosis of depression, unipolar depression, is incorrect. And we know that because the hospitalization is so clear, you know, like they were actually there for 10 days. <laughs> and, you know, and so, so you, yeah, no, it's an excellent point. But, but here, but should, you try to should you even do it? Do it? I don't know. I don't know. I honestly don't know uh, if we should. I think, um, yeah, no, I, I, we... We, we also compared, it's a good, and another thing that I didn't include is we also compared to a chart review of the, of the clinical charts um, in 120 individuals. Uh, and, and that may be a better um, gold standard in a sense. Like, um, but, but, but yeah, the question what a gold standard is in the context of psychiatry is, is a complicated one. But here you, are, you said that the those who conduct the interview, they have access to the electronic health record. So yeah. if, it, if it's not a gold standard, it still makes sense that it's going to be slightly better than the diagnosis just based on the EHR, right? Um, or, I mean, not always, but... Yeah, not I always. I, I, you know, I mean, it, yeah, I don't know how much I want to say, like, I was not going to make a fool of myself. With, the, <laughs> with this video here, but like, I, I, I believe that, um, that this, you know, the, yeah, that the interview, the skit interview is also often wrong, uh, because we're not asking the interviewer to review the EHR, right? We don't say, read everything in the EHR about this patient and then do the interview. Uh, we, we just, we just ha they have access, they have to, access it. to it, yeah. Right. And so we've never, I mean, if I were to do this right now, I would be much more structured about what kind of access, you know, who, you know, and how we're going to provide access to the EHR. If you use it, what do you look up? What, you know, what actual information are you using from there? Uh, but obviously that, that wasn't, we didn't even know that we could use the EHR at the moment that these interviews were being conducted. But yeah, so. I hope I'm going to convince you that they that actually run, running this is a useful exercise. Um, for another reason, um, so so we ask the question: Can we do better? We're using all these features in the EHR, the medication, their diagnosis, um, and also symptoms recorded in the text. And we uh, try to and we use here to train on the skid diagnosis using 181 features. These are the most common features, and they often have to do with diagnoses, like most recent. MDD diagnosis, uh, specific codes of bipolar disorder, if there was a mania code or, um, or a depression code, but also were delusions mentioned in, um, in the clinical text? Were, was grandiosity mentioned? How long were people hospitalized for? Were they on antidepressants, etc.? But as it turns out, we're not doing any better than from if we just take the last diagnosis. Here you see the precision recall and ROC curves, and uh, interestingly enough, the dots here are what you get from just using the last ICD code. And the dots are right on the line of the curves and basically on the, you know, almost on the best place on the curve. And so we're not, um, initially I thought this was a mistake because it looks like a mistake, right? Uh, but basically what we get from just using the last ICD code, the closest one to the interview, is identical to what we could get from this prediction algorithm. 
But it doesn't mean that this, this whole exercise was futile because what we do get are now probabilities. So uh, we here uh, this, this, um, this triangle um, has the probabilities for, in this, this case it was um, a model with three outcomes, depression, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and these are the probabilities of each individual in that model. And so um, here, for example, I'm showing the people that were classified correctly originally and their probability in the, in the model space. And you can see that, um, or can I, can you see this? Oh yeah, you can see that schizophrenia is kind of far away from bipolar and depression and they're a little bit easier to classify. Um, but bipolar to depression is almost a continuum and these are the people that are correctly classified, right? So now if we look at those people that were incorrectly classified, the ones that are here off diagonal, we see that they fall a little bit more here in the between on this continuum between bipolar and depression. And so even though the model doesn't improve performance, we can learn from it in the sense that we can, you know, we can get a probability distribution of, of these individuals. And so one of the plans um, for us is to use these for genetic studies, right? Because now, instead of just having yes, no for some categories, we actually have like, given your EHR data, where do you fall on this continuum? Um, and we can see, for example, here, the, on, here are patients um, with, these are all patients with bipolar disorder, and these are patients um, that uh, start their onset with a depressive episode and later uh, go on to develop mania. Their probability of bipolar type 1 are, are much more um, sort of in the middle compared to the extreme are the cases, the extreme bipolar cases are those that first time they show up in the hospital, they have a manic episode. Um, and so we can see these kind of things and we hope um, that this will be useful for genetics. Okay, so yes, these diagnoses are accurate compared to what is considered to be the gold standard in the, in the field, uh, and also there's value to having more data in the EHR. I already mentioned using these symptoms in our models, but we can actually extract symptoms from, uh, from, the, uh, from the free text. Um, so, you know, this is one of the, you know, critiques of using biobank data is a question well, you don't know what kind of symptoms these patients have, and some are transdiagnostic, and some are ones that we might want to use for our genetic studies, such as suicidal ideation or delusions or hallucinations. And so we set out initially um, to extract these four symptoms or phenotypes uh, by doing a very simple thing, like we had clinicians read sentences and tag these phenotypes in the sentence. And then we just basically did a named entity recognition where we basically look up what, what uh, patterns make up specific symptoms. And then we evaluate performance both at the, at the level of sentences as well as at the level of patients. And so it turns out that, you know, this works really well. So precision is really very high. That means if, you know, I mean, I guess I don't have to tell you what precision is. Um, if the algorithm identifies a, a, a suicidal ideation, it's very highly uh, likely to be correct. Recall is, is a little bit worse, as you might expect, um, because, um, but, but, but still really quite high. And so, um, but there are only so many ways, there are so many ways of writing a certain symptom, and sometimes they are very complicated. Um, for example, a uh, patient walks into a street with, a busy, busy street with cars. And then, you know, like, was that a suicide attempt or was that just a moment and why is it recorded in the note? And so to make the gold standard here, we had two people um, actually uh, phenotype tag each sentence. And then if there was a discrepancy, we had a third annotator um, sort of break the tie and it was complicated to get to the gold standard. And so, um, yeah. We don't expect recall to be, to be perfect. 
Uh, we also looked at, uh, we also did chart review where we now ask clinicians to read the entire chart and, you know, was this patient ever suicidal? Because some, some things might be read between the lines where it's not one sentence that actually specifies it, but rather like sort of a feeling that you get from reading a whole note. Um, and so uh, also in this case, here we require two mentions for, uh, to call a case positive. Uh, and uh, here are the results from that. And so we also think this is um, excellent performance. Of course, if you require more mentions, uh, your positive predict predictive value goes up uh, at a cost of recall. And so in our case, the F1 is optimized if we require two mentions um, for all of these. Actually, funnily enough, we also had these false positives. Like we had 12 cases where the algorithm identified patients having suicidal ideation and uh, the chart review did not. And so we were sort of surprised because there were two mentions and we know that the precision was so high. Uh, and so we, we went back and had clinicians re-evaluate the evidence that, um, that the algorithm, uh, you know, the evidence that the algorithm selected basically, like the sentences where they find those mentions combined with true positives uh, and, you know, the clinicians were not aware of what they were reading and then they had to, uh, had to evaluate, is this sufficient evidence to call this person suicidal ideation, suicide attempt, etc. And based on that, we had two people uh, review that and only if they both agreed that there was sufficient evidence, we would call it a mistake in a sense. And based on that, like in nine out of the 12 cases, both uh, reviewers actually uh, agreed that this was a suicidal ideation. And so this shows that there is a limit um, to also human ability to read charts. You know, there is a lot of evidence and an algorithm can just crank through. Um, but for humans, you know, humans are uh, inherited. You know, they're just limited. So that was an exciting exercise for us. Okay. So this works really well. It's very simple, but it works really well. And so we're currently expanding this to include 100 features. I mean, we don't know if all those 100 are going to make it, uh, if, you know, if their quality will be high enough. But just to give you a little sense of what the text looked like, this is one note of one patient. And this is one of the first sentence. And the way the annotation currently works is like, here are, in this particular sentence, um, the annotations are irritability, insomnia, psychomotor agitation, aggressivity, and depressed mood. So there's really a lot of work, but we really hope that <laughs> this is going to be helpful for our genetic studies. What about disease trajectories? Um, yeah, um, switching between, di even though diagnoses at a given moment are very accurate, we know that switching between diagnoses is very common. 57% uh, of patients with multiple visits were assigned multiple primary diagnoses. Um, and so a lot of work that we do is focusing on, you know, how, what kind of sense can we make out of these trajectories? Uh, Juan de la Hoz has a paper uh, where we looked at this diagnostic instability and what are features that affect how stable uh, uh, diagnoses are. Um, so we see, for example, that as you might expect in the beginning of your treatment, diagnoses are more unstable and they get more stable over time. Uh, but for example, if you had a previous diagnostic switch, you're more likely to, to, to switch again. So instability induces more instability. And here are some of the features that actually uh, are associated with diagnostic uh, stability. For example, if you have a delusion mentioned in your visit, you're more likely to change diagnosis in the next visit. Um, Another feature that is much more what we would expect is uh, a diagnosis that says in one way or another that it's not otherwise specified, so it's not a very spe specific diagnosis, you're more likely to switch in the next visit or change diagnosis in the next visit, uh, which makes sense. We also have uh, electronic health records from Sura. Uh, Juan uh, Pablo Valencia is leading this effort to build this EHR database uh, as well as analyze it. He's here, so go say hi to him. Um, Sura, we have about 5 million patients, but primarily in the Paisa region. We currently have recruited from Sura 33,000 individuals. 
uh, and uh, we have their whole EHR in the standard sense of EHR. So for example, 16% of these individuals have type 2 diabetes uh, as recorded in their EHR. And as I mentioned, we also have for some of the cases, or about 20 to 25% of the cases, we have both their psychiatric EHR and their general SURA insurance EHR. And that is really interesting. In, you know, we can use it both to anchor um, our algorithms, but also uh, to study these things com combined. So for example, we now are embarking on this project to study the effects of COVID in this uh, population of patients with severe mental illness. And we can see using their SURA EHR that actually cases get their first vaccine about a month after uh, controls. We can also combine the actual content of the EHR and we, for example, here, this is super preliminary, but uh, I'm showing it anyway, like what we can see is that those patients that have um, a, a positive COVID infection recorded in their EHR uh, have an increase in um, in suicidal ideation recorded in their psychiatric EHR compared to pre-pandemic baseline. And we don't see that increase in, um, uh, in those that did not have a COVID uh, positive uh, test in their EHR. Of course, this is a very small sample with just 850 cases. So um, yeah, we want to replicate this, but it does highlight the potential vulnerability of as patients with severe mental illness during the pandemic. And we're, uh, yeah, as I said, we're starting a study uh, to do this more systematically now. So Mission Origin, it will be one of the largest genetic studies uh, of severe mental illness in the world. Um, here is a picture that you might know, all the biobanks um, that there are. Uh, the x-axis are the um, years that the enrollment started and the y-axis is the percentage of non-European ancestry participants and they're colored by uh, continent and you can see that South America is purple and there's no purple um, biobank and so mission origin will be the first purple dot on the map. Um, so how is it going and what about genetic data? Do you have any? Um, so we currently have 18,000 cases uh, recruited, uh, as well as 33,000 controls. And we have the first sequence data that we got just last month or two months ago uh, using this blended genome exome product. Um, we are expected to get an additional, we get up to 30,000 uh, hopefully by the end of this year. Uh, so we currently have more data coming in than we can handle. Uh, just in case there are tra trainees out there. Um, and I'm just showing one slide of genetics uh, just because it's exciting that it's coming. Um, here you can see the Paisa region and uh, uh, this, is, um, this is the proportion. This is based on admixture proportions of three European, Native American and African ancestry. Here I'm showing the proportion of European ancestry. Uh, the averages by municipality. So here are all the municipalities where our patients, our, our participants are coming from. I'm only including here those, that, uh, those municipalities, municipalities that have more than, I think, five participants. And you can see that there is some structure uh, of, uh, of overall ancestry. Here are uh, the, three, um, the three continental ancestries that um, that the admixture was uh, run on uh, and it's kind of uh, nice uh, to see um, I, I tried to like I tried to overlay it with the geography of, of the region but it's it's very interesting that here for example you have African ancestry um, the north of the Paisa region is more flat and has a history of more um, Landbau, is Peter Fisher in the world? No um, Gosh. Um, crops, like, uh, how do you say, like, uh, farming. Yes, <laughs> farming is here. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this, this, is, this is more flat and, far, uh, and f traditionally farmland, but also gold mining and in the past. And here is where the mountains start. And we can see that that really sort of aligns with um, 
uh, with ancestry that we still see today uh, based on the participants' address. Um, so yeah, obviously we're excited about this. Um, this is just like a sort of, let's look at what's, what's coming. Okay, so yes, I, I, com I call this combining biobanks and cohort study the best of both worlds. I hope to have convinced you that uh, you know, with mission origin, we, we can have careful diagnoses and more, like we can even have these probabilities and longitudinal uh, diagnoses or longitudinal trajectories. Phenotyping we can do quite well, uh, partially from notes, but also structured data. Uh, having broad inclusion criteria, I think is very meaningful because in the end, we want to know um, you know, we want to understand the genetics of severe mental illness as it is in our, you know, in our society, uh, as opposed to as it is in these very selected uh, uh, pockets uh, of, uh, you know, for example, uh, patients that are, you know, that are very selected in a specific way. And we want to understand the differences between these diagnoses too. Um, longitudinal information I think is amazing. I don't need to convince anybody here. Uh, and, I, and I also believe that we will have the sample sizes for discovery. So with mission origin, we can begin to fill this gap. Um, and uh, I want to end uh, with, because really this is a, a ton of work. Uh, it is, uh, you know, all these participants are recruited uh, by individual uh, contact. Uh, it's not like we send out an email or people automatically consent into the study. Everybody is um, contacted and so we have a very amazing uh, recruitment team in Colombia and a lot of other uh, collaborators involved uh, to make this happen. Um, so we're very excited for that. Um, yeah, um, I don't know, are there any questions? <laughs>